Uh, you have the wrong name under Council Member Miller. Oh. Yeah. Hey, Council Member, thank you for that correction. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, we're going live now. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Committee on Subcommittees on Landmarks. Will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Please place your cell phones and electronic devices on vibrate. Any testimony can be sent to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. We are ready to begin. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions. I'm joined remotely today by Council Members Barron, Traeger, Ku, and Miller. Today, we will be holding public hearings on four affordable housing projects, a rescission of a prior landmark designation, and amendments of two prior landmark designations. But first, a quorum being present, we will vote to approve LU 663, an application related to the 2274 Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard project submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law for approval of an urban development action area project, waiver of the area designation requirement, waiver of the requirements of sections 197C and 197D of the New York City Charter, and approval of a real property tax exemption for property located at 24 West 132nd Street, 37 West 138th Street, 202 West 133rd Street, 2274 Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard in Council Member Perkins District in Manhattan. The subcommittee held a hearing on this application on May 27th and Council Member Perkins is supportive of this project. Council, please call the roll. Adams. I vote aye. Ku. Council Member Ku, you're on mute. Okay. I will aye. Baron. Uh, I have a question before I vote. Madam Chair. Baron? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is of the 36 residents that presently live in this development, uh, will they be guaranteed or allowed to remain as renters if they don't want to purchase? Or might there be some chance that if they don't purchase, they would be evicted? Chair Adams, we can, we can obtain that information for, for Council Member Barron. Thank you. Um, do, you do you require this information to proceed with the vote? Uh, not having it, uh, I would abstain. Thank you. We, we can proceed with the vote and you can pass and we'll leave the vote open until we get this information. Thank you, then I'll pass. Okay. Council Member Miller. Um, I think that information is pertinent to the vote as well, so I'll be passing until the information becomes available. Council Member Traeger. I, I also requested information, please. All right, we will obtain that information. Uh, Chair Adams, do you, uh, do you request that the vote be left open? The vote will be left open, thank you. Before we begin today's public hearings, I again recognize the Subcommittee Council to review the remote hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Adams. I'm Jeffrey Campagna, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. If you are a member of the public who wants to watch this hearing, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. 
All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized by the chair to testify. Each applicant panel will be recognized as a group. Members of the public will be recognized one at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your mic will be unmuted. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have any, if you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, you can email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear in the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order they raise their hands. Chair Adams will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Council members may have questions. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Adams will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Council. I now open the public hearings on four affordable housing projects submitted for our consideration by HPD. LU-666 Weeksville NCP, LU-667 and 668 Old Stanley, 641 Chauncey, LU-669 Old Stanley II, and LU-670 Open Door Bed-Stuy Central and North One. LU-666 Weeksville NPC is an application submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law of New York State 7C of the New York City Charter for the designation of an Urban Development Action Area, an Urban Development Action Area project for such area, and the disposition of such property to a developer to be selected by HPD for property located at 1559 through 1563 Prospect Place, Borough of Brooklyn, Community District 8, in the council district represented by council member Amprey Samuel. This application states that it will facilitate the construction of 44 residential units for low income, moderate income, and middle income families, and that up to 30% of the units may be rented to formerly homeless families, subject to project underwriting. I now recognize my colleague, council member Amprey Samuel to offer remarks on this project. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you so much, Chair Adams, for the opportunity to share a few words on the proposed Weeksville NCP development at 1559-1563 Prospect Place in my district. Um, although I hate the land use number, <laughs> just because of my upbringing, <laughs> um, I will continue. Um, as noted, this eight-story building with 44 units of affordable housing will include a much needed 26 apartments exclusively for seniors, which is 60% of the units in the building, and a set aside of formal homes at 30% AMI, with rent ranging from $377 to $683. And family rents will range from $1,070 to $623 for two bedrooms with a four-year regulatory limit. At a time when we have seen heated debates causing great division across our city because of the use of hotels and shelters. And in fact, we have a Punta hotel being used as a shelter that's five blocks down the street from this very location. I'm pleased to see we are moving forward with this highly anticipated development. This lot has been vacant for quite some time and we currently have NYPD floodlights just out the way. So clearly it's a much needed development. Although I'm pleased this is moving forward possibly, I always have the same three concerns with all developments in my district. One is to ensure that the units remain affordable based on what my constituents can actually afford. Two, ensuring that there is adequate outreach and reflection of my district, in particular community board residents, to be the ones that will be able to move into this shiny new building. And third, that the jobs during the construction phases will actually employ local hires. Everyone talks to the name in the beginning when we are going through zone approvals and council hearings. But when the job was in the ground, there were a million excuses as to why deals can't be completed without an increase in costs and why local residents cannot be hired at the site. At this little time we are experiencing, this project has to be different. And I look forward to working with the proposed developer in HPD in a month to come to ensure that this building is for us and constructed by us. So, and in support of the project, 
um, but those are my concerns. Um, and that is so thank you so much for the opportunity and um, I look forward to my success. Thank you so thank much, you council so member. We will also hear three items on two different phases of the Old Stanley Affordable Home Ownership Project. LU 667 and 668 both concern the 641 Chauncey phase of the Old Stanley Project. Both applications were submitted by HPD. LU 668 was submitted pursuant to Article 16 of the General, General Municipal Law and Section 197C of the New York City Charter for the designation of an urban development action area an urban development action area project for such area and for the disposition of such property to a developer to be selected by HPD. LU 667 was submitted pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law requesting an exemption from real property taxes for the disposition area. Both items relate to property located at 641 Chauncey Street, Borough of Brooklyn, Community District 4, Council District 37. Council District 37 is presently vacant. We will also hear LU 669 on Old Stanley II, submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law, requesting the approval of an urban development action area project, waiver of the designation requirements of sections 197C and 197D of the Charter, and an exemption from real property taxes for property located at 676 Central Avenue and 1277 DeKalb Avenue, Borough of Brooklyn, in Council District 34, which is represented by Council Member Reynoso and Council District 37, which is vacant. I don't think that Council Member Reynoso is here at this hearing to testify today. So we will continue. The last HPD item we will hear is LU 670, Open Door bed -Stuy Central and North 1, submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law requesting the approval of an urban development action area project, waiver of the designation requirements of sections 197C and 197D of the Charter, and an exemption from real property taxes for 16 properties located in Brooklyn Community Districts 3 and 8 in the council district represented by Council Member Cornegie. I now recognize Council Member Cornegie for his opening statement and welcome. Council member, you're muted. Good afternoon. So uh, I want to thank council members Adams and all the subcommittee members, council member Salamanca, and all the many agency and council staff and community members who worked on this open door bed -Stuy Central and North One project. I'm supportive of the project land use 0670 2020 because it ties into a long-standing concern I've had with housing and affordable rentals. Are while housing and affordable rentals are incredibly important, but too often providing a pathway for affordable home ownership is overlooked. Providing home ownership opportunities and providing households in our shared communities with a pathway to building wealth through home ownership is a part of housing policy we need to continue to focus on. We need the opportunities for intergenerational wealth. Building home ownership provides home ownership also links with flexibility in starting a small business and pursuing entrepreneurship, higher education, and serving as engaged stakeholders in the community. I'm also grateful for the work the developer and their team have done with respect to community engagement. Gaining the unanimous support of the community board and the Landmarks Preservation Commission were important in my support of this. Also important have had also important, the engagement they have had with my office, meeting with me and my staff, answering questions, and really actively helping us all understand the mission and vision and how that fits into the future of our community. Thanks again to the subcommittee for hearing this important land use item this afternoon, and I really look forward to the important project proceeding. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, uh, council members, uh, Adrian Adams and Raphael Salamanca for leading this. Thank you so much, Council Member Cornegie, for your remarks today, and good to see you. You too. Council, Council, please call the first panel for this item.
The first pair will be Salazar, Mallory, Lang, and Lenny Seif on behalf of HPD. Drew Vanderberg of Riseboro Community Partnerships will present on LU 667, 668, and 669 for both Old Stanley projects. Michael Gabori and Alexis Sewell of Settlement Fund will present on LU 666, the Weeksville NCP project, and Ben Chevolian, hope we got that right, of Heritage 5 LLC, who is available to answer questions about LU 670, the outdoor bed Central North One project. Please unmute the panelists. Have all of the panelists been unmuted? They have not been all unmuted. If you have not been unmuted and you are on this panel, please unmute yourself. I, I'm, I'm unmuted now, Lenny Seif. Yes, you're unmuted, Lenny. Okay. Get all panelists from me. Do you all have your video turned on as well? All panelists should on and unmute. I believe we're with Chair Adams. Okay, thank you. Council, please administer the information. Panelists, please use your right hands. State your names in some semblance order. Uh, Sarah Mallory from HPD. Lynn Zang from HPD. Lenny Seif from HPD. Drew Vanderberg. Drew Vanderberg, Riseboro Community Partnership. Michael Gabry, Settlement Housing Fund. Alexa Sewell, Settlement Housing Fund. Thank you. Please keep your hands raised. Do you affirm the truth, the whole truth, and but the truth in your testimony for the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask HPD to present all four projects after which council members will be able to ask questions of the panel. We are in receipt of your PowerPoint presentations from the NPC and the old Stanley items. When you're ready for these presentations, they will be displayed. The presentations will advance to the next slide when you say next. Finally, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record, and then you may begin. Um, thank you. My name is Sarah Mallory with HPD, and I will start by talking to the uh, Weeksville project first. Great. Uh, land use item number C200. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Everything just disappeared from my screen because we're sharing. Uh, give me one second. Okay. Uh, land use item number C200106 HAK is related to the urban land use review process or ULERP application seeking urban development action area designation, disposition, and project approval for three vacant city owned lots located at 1559-1563 Prospect Avenue, Block 1363, Lots 90, 91, and 92. The project is known as Weeksville NCP at Prospect Place, Brooklyn, in Council District 41. The sponsors of the project, the Peachwood Organization and Settlement Housing Fund, were selected through a competitive process and have proposed to develop these city-owned sites under HPD's new construction program, or NCP. 
Under NCP, sponsors purchase city-owned or privately owned land or vacant buildings and construct multifamily buildings in order to create up to 45 units of rental housing on infill sites affordable to families earning up to 80% area median income. Programmatically, up to 30% of the units may be set aside for homeless families and individuals preferred from the Department of Homeless Services. The proposed development will consist of one newly constructed eight-story residential building with approximately 44 affordable rental units and one superintendent's unit. Of the 45 units, 26 will be made available for seniors. The proposed development will include a mix of 22 studio, eight one-bedroom, and 15 two-bedroom apartments. Income tiers include 0% for homeless, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, and 70% of AMI, and rents will range from up to $388 for a studio at the lowest AMI tier to $1,606 for a two-bedroom unit at the highest AMI tier. Built to exceed enterprise green community standards for their healthy and energy efficient building, it will also include a community room, laundry room, bike storage, and recreational area. Today, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of the Weeksville NCP project in order to facilitate construction of this affordable residential building. With that, I defer uh, to the folks who are working on this project to tell a little bit more on the development team. Applicant, uh, please accept the unmute request when you receive it. Who else is speaking on this uh, on this project? So Michael Gabry. Michael Gabry. Okay, please unmute Michael Gabry. Great, thank you very much. And I think we can, sorry, I'll, I'm just looking at the presentation here. So, uh, so good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Adams and members of the subcommittee. I'm Michael Gabriel. I'm the Deputy Director of Housing Development at Settlement Housing Fund, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present our Weeksville Place project to you today. And I also want to thank Council Member Amprey Samuel for her opening remarks uh, and comments in support of the project. Uh, so I think if we, if we can go to the next slide, please. I'm trying to see if this is the same. This looks like this might be a different presentation than we had we flip to the next slide, please. Just having a technical issue for a moment, sorry. Oh, no problem. Okay, and then actually we can go one more slide. Great. Great, thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce the development team. Uh, Settlement Housing Fund is the lead developer for this project. We are a citywide nonprofit affordable housing developer, and we currently own and operate around 2,000 units of affordable housing. We also operate a community center on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx and oversee numerous community programs. Around half of our portfolio is in the South Bronx, but we have concentrations of investment in Upper and Lower Manhattan and in the Crown Heights, Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn. We were thrilled to be awarded the site in Weeksville, as it is only a couple of blocks from our buildings and programs on St. John's Place. There we own and operate a 97 bed tier two homeless shelter, which includes daycare, infant care, after school programming, and a SUNY attained computer training lab. We have two permanent affordable housing developments and oversee a community garden on the same block. We've had a presence in Crown Heights since 1990 and the imperative for affordable housing in and around the neighborhood is only intensified over time. So we are looking forward to getting started on this project. Our co-developer and general contractor is the Beachwood Organization, a builder with over 35 years of experience in the New York metropolitan area. They have a record of building high quality housing on time and on budget. Our architect is Edelman Sultan Knox Wood, a highly regarded firm with substantial experience designing affordable housing projects. We have worked with them on a number of our developments. N uh, next slide, please. So the next slide is our site location and context. The site, which is currently vacant, and you can see uh, is framed in red. Uh, the site uh, is located on the north side of Prospect Place between Ralph and Buffalo Avenues. The lots total about 8,342 square feet 
and are zoned R6. Our project requires no change to the zoning, so the development is as of right. The immediate surrounding area of the project is primarily residential in nature with some community facility and institutional uses. For example, the Weeksville Heritage Center is 0.1 miles away. Uh, next slide, please. Great. This slide is the rendering of our proposed building. As previously mentioned, the, eight, the building is eight stories, comprising 45 units, inclusive of one supers unit. Its massing comprises two parts, an elevated volume with a taller massing set, set back and wrapping underneath to serve as a base. The, eight, the, the taller eight-story mass will be clad in brick, which matches the surrounding buildings. Meanwhile, the elevated volume will be clad in cement panels arranged in a herringbone pattern that takes inspiration from the intricate detailing in the existing brick of the neighboring buildings. There will be extensive glass at the first floor, which will animate the facade and open the building up to the street in an inviting way. Under the elevated piece, we have the lobby, and on the right, we have the community room. We change, um, I would like to point out just a design change from the time of this rendering. We changed from window ACs to through wall ACs, which eliminates the protruding boxes on the facade. There will now only be louvers flesh with the facade. Lastly, Due to the perspective of the rendering, the building appears to protrude from the street line. However, this is not the case. It is set back. And this is depicted on the next slide of the, seat, of, of the site plan. So if we can switch to the next slide, please, that would be great. So this is the site plan. So as you can see more clearly, the building is set further back from the street line compared to the neighboring buildings. This helps to soften the boundary between the building and the street. The site plan also shows the rear yard, which will be landscape and offer recreational space for the tenants. Next slide, please. The next slide is the ground floor plan. So as you can see, there will be landscaping al along the street line. And in addition, as we enter the building, there will be a generous lobby and an adjacent community room and warming pantry available for the tenants to use. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide summarizes our proposed unit mix and as previously stated we have 26 of these units will be designated for seniors 19 will be designated for families and individuals uh, inclusive of the supers unit and then as you can see the project offers a range of affordability from 30 percent ami to 70 percent ami uh, next slide please so this is our development summary so in addition to what's noted on this slide i'd like to highlight our weeksville place project presents an incredibly productive use for this long underutilized land. In addition, uh, other highlights are we're very proud that this is a nonprofit led development team. Uh, again, 45 units serving seniors, families and individuals and formerly homeless. Uh, we have an attractive contextual design and we offer a range of affordability. And um, next slide, please. It's just our, our development timeline. So as you can see, we hope to have ULERP approval by this fall and are working closely with HPD to close next year in the summer fall of 2021. With that, thank you for the privilege of allowing me, allowing me to present today. And if we wanna to flip to the next slide, I can open it up to questions. Questions are actually going to come at the end of this. Oh, fine. thank you. HPD, you may proceed with the next Great. Okay. presentation. Uh, again, Sarah Mallory with HPD, and I will go ahead and discuss uh, Old Stanley 1 and 2. Land use items number 668 and 669 are related to ULERP application number C200188 HAK and UDAP application for a project known as Old Stanley. The land use applications seek UDAP designation, disposition, and project approval, as well as Article 11 tax exemptions for three vacant city-owned lots. Land use number 668 is related to the application for Old Stanley Phase 1, located at 641 Chauncey Street, Block 3444, Lot 18, in Brooklyn Council District 37, and land use item number 669 is related to the application for Old Stanley 2, DeKalb Central, Block 3440, Lot 35, Block 3232, Lot 63 in Brooklyn Council District 34 and 37. The city and properties are slated for development under HPD's Open Door Program, along with privately owned property located on Block 3389, Lot 45, and Block 3401, Lots 37 and 38. 
Under Open Door, sponsors purchase city owned or privately owned land and construct cooperative or condominium buildings and where lot size permits. The program may also fund the construction of one to three family homes affordable to moderate and middle income households. The selected development team, Riseboro Community Partnerships, will develop the disposition area with an eight unit co-op building and two two family homes. More specifically, Old Stanley One will include four one bedroom units, two two bedroom units, and two three bedroom units that will be affordable to households earning between 80% and 100% of the AMI. The projected sales prices are to roughly $201,400 to $266,900 for a one bedroom. $299,500 to $309,700 for a two bedroom and $287,800 to $317,700 for a three bedroom unit. Old Stanley II will include two two family homes with estimated sale price ranging between $630,800 to $650,200. Each home contains a rental unit projected rental income of approximately $1,944 to $2,300. In total, including development on the private sites, Riseboro proposes to construct 23 home ownership units affordable to households earning incomes between 80% and 110% AMI as part of the old Stanley project. The homes will be built to meet enterprise green housing standards. It should be noted that once completed, the cooperative will sell the units to households who agree to owner occupy their homes for the length of the regulatory period. As part of the open door program, purchasers are required to abide by resale restrictions. If a homeowner sells or refinances during the regulatory period, the homeowner may realize up to 2% appreciation on the original purchase price per year of owner occupancy. Additionally, homeowners will also be required to sell to a household earning no more than the project's income limit. In addition to disposition approval, HPD seeks approval of tax benefits for both land use items. For Old Stanley One, HPD seeks approval of Article 11 tax benefits in order to help maintain affordability for these homeownership units. The term of the tax exemption will be 40 years that will be coterminous with the regulatory agreement. For Old Stanley Two, following the date of the conveyance from sponsor to the purchasing homeowner, the Article 11 tax exemption will cease and each home will receive tax benefits under the UDOT statutes for a period of 20 years. The first 10 years of full exemption, followed by 10 years of decreasing amounts in 10 equal allotments on an annual basis. In order to facilitate construction of the old Stanley project, as well as maintain affordability, HPD is before the subcommittee requesting approval of land use numbers 668 and 669. And that concludes HPD's testimony on this project and I turn it over to others. Is there a presentation with this application? And who is presenting at the presentation? Please unmute Drew Vanderberg. Hello all, can you hear me? This is Drew Vanderberg from Riseboro Community Partnership. Thank you so much for having us here today to speak on the Old Stanley Project, Chairperson Adams, subcommittee members, and everyone out there. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit more about the project, which we're very excited to bring, having been working on this project with HPD and our design team for many years. So you can advance to the next slide, please. So here is a map of this scattered site project. As mentioned, there are four buildings across I'm uh, sorry, I meant to say five buildings across six different tax lots in the project. And what we are discussing today is the Euler on 641 Chauncey Street and the accelerated UDAP on the two other HPD owned sites, 1277 DeKalb and 676 Central. And then Riseboro, along with Neighborhood Restore, has brought two additional sites to the project to create this home ownership opportunity for the citizens of Bushwick and New York City as a whole. Um, I also just want to draw attention to Council Member Cornegie's testimony at the beginning, um, where he laid out clearly the imperative for home ownership and the opportunities that provides for our communities. And so that is a big part of HPD's Housing 2.0 plan, and we would like to see this project move forward to provide this. 
So um, the, the red dots represent the other sites and the blue dots are the sites that we're discussing today. We can look at the next slide now, please. So this is the current state of the sites in Bushwick, 641. Chauncey is rather larger, grassy site, and then these two um, narrow infill lots um, are, represent Old Stanley too. Next slide, please. So to start with Old Stanley One, this is the building that is proposed for 641 Chauncey Street. It will be an eight unit building, which we are proposing to make a co-op building. So the occupants will be homeowners, will also be joined together in a cooperative manner, which adds additional agency for residents to um, own there. It's not just condos, but they're all a part of the ownership structure of the building. Uh, the AMIs are 80% to 100%. Um, and this is with Rosborough as a nonprofit who also does a lot of rental projects and uh, special needs housing. Um, I acknowledge that those AMIs are a little bit higher than what Riseboro tends to do, but we want to serve all different income ranges across New Yorkers and uh, we'll continue to do what we can to keep these AMIs as low as possible as we finalize the underwriting of the project. But as currently envisioned, you can see uh, the qualifying incomes of residents between 64K and 110K a year and sales prices between 201K and 317K. So still for the property market in New York City, this is an extremely affordable ownership opportunity. Um, also, this building will have um, amenities such as in-unit washer and dryers, bicycle storage, and access to a rear yard. Uh, you can also see that uh, in the front of the rendering, there's a bit of a flower planting area to separate from the sidewalk to the uh, unit on the first floor. And um, we'll be designing the building to Enterprise Green Community Standards for heightened energy sustainability and uh, different air tightness. We're also looking at potential rooftop amenities such as a green roof or solar panels in the long run because Riseboro does value energy sustainability and energy performance to add additional affordability to all of our buildings. So very excited about this one. Let's move to the next slide. You can just see a quick view of the siting for the project where the yard is visible in the back and uh, the ground floor, floor plan there just to show you that there's gonna be substantial space for families to live and two and three bedroom units as well as one bedrooms throughout the building. Go on to the next slide, please. So for Old Stanley II, we have these smaller two unit buildings. Um, and so in this case, you'll have um, duplexes on the ground floor and then up above smaller units. And the people who choose to purchase these homes will be able to sublease the smaller units at an affordable uh, income to sub renters. So these are the fee simple homes and you can see the qualifying incomes at about 118,000 a year and sales prices around 675 average um, for these buildings. So also quite affordable for the Bushwick area, same amenities as the previous building and same emphasis on uh, green energy standards as required by HPD and beyond. So let's keep on moving through. Just some floor plans. For this, I know it's a little hard to see, but just wanted to show once again, there's the yard and then you can see how an average floor is laid out with uh, several bedrooms, two bathrooms in some of the units. So it's, it's a great opportunity for folks to raise families. The ground floor also has access directly to the backyard from the living quarters. So I think they're really great designs. We can keep moving. So it was mentioned that Riseboro is bringing a few other sites to the project. These were provided through the TPT program in partnership with Neighborhood Restore. There are also vacant lots right now. So in addition to the three buildings we're discussing today, these are the other two buildings that will be provided at affordable incomes as well. And the other eight unit one is also co-op. So um, just so you know, let's keep going. This is a summary of everything we've discussed. Um, five new buildings 
And just to be clear, there are 23 total units, 19 home ownership units, and then four of them, which are sub rental units within the cluster. Affordability is between 80% to 110% of AMI. And 78% uh, of the 23 are two and three bedroom units. To be precise, there are 12 three bedroom units. So it's just important to us to do larger uh, units with more bedrooms so that folks can stay for the long haul and raise families in these properties. There's the amenities again, and then all of the requirements of the HBD Open Door Program. Also, just to quickly highlight our team here, um, this is a public asset with city land, which is why we're here today. Um, Riseboro is a long time nonprofit organization in Bushwick, We've been around since the 70s, and we do not only housing, but many other services, which I'll show on the next slide. And then um, our architect, Stat Architecture, is an MWBE firm, meaning minority and women owned business enterprise. So we're glad to make sure that city funds are going towards those types of businesses. We can move on to the next, please. This is just an overview of Riseboro's resources in Bushwick because um, I like to emphasize that residents of the housing that we develop will also receive upstream services to all of the rest of the things we provide in the neighborhood. So we own 1,845 units and we manage even more. Um, and we also have 132 operating affordable housing buildings in the neighborhood with social services, legal aid and benefits assistance available to our residents at our housing office right there. Uh, but then we also have four other divisions, which is our empowerment division that focuses on workforce development, make sure that we're doing local hiring and MWBE and a lot of work with anti eviction work and racial equity in recent times. So we're continuing to build out our empowerment division in the neighborhood. We also have a health division with a wellness rising program farmers markets, which have also been doing a lot of great work. Um, related to the COVID-19 pandemic, keeping our folks safe in our buildings and throughout the neighborhood. We have a seniors division. So if anybody who moves into this, these buildings becomes senior citizen, they will also have access to potential, uh, our, all the programs that we run out of our nine senior centers in the neighborhood, and also the Meals on Wheels program and home health aids, which will be available in the long run. And also, of course, they can move into other sites, it just so happens that the 641 Chauncey building is next door to another Riseboro Senior Center. So there are services available literally next door to that building. And lastly, of course, there'll be families in these buildings. We run a youth center at 1474 Gates with tons of after school programming and uh, cultural activities, as well as a summer youth employment program. So glad to be able to provide all these services. That's the end of it questions, please. And you can also contact me at the uh, address below if you have any additional questions after this presentation. Thank you very much. I believe we have one more presentation. Uh, Councilmember Barron has a question before we go on. Councilmember Barron, just unmute. Councilmember, you're still muted. Okay. Now it's off? Okay. I need to double click, like my mouse. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have some questions on this project. Uh, this is located in Council District. Uh, for the projects on DeKalb and Central Avenue, that's on Council District 37, I believe, and perhaps 34. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, um, two of them are in 37, and then the 1277 DeKalb is in Reynosa's District uh, 34. Okay. Um, I have some concerns, and I'm going to speak uh, as a as, uh, concerned about my neighboring district because they do not have a representative speaking on their behalf at this time. 
I believe you said that the price of the homes, the income requirement is $118,000 and the price of the home would be $675,000? That was true for the two fee simple homes, the small buildings, yes. Okay, those are the two fee simple homes you said? Yes. And that's a two family home? Yes. And one unit would be rental? Correct. But do you think that you're calling these affordable at $675,000 and they're looking at the New York City general that might be within the range of what a home would cost, but for the income level of District 37 and $118,000, which is more than 100% of the AMI, is not reflective of the people who live in this community. I understand that and I agree with you. And uh, I wanna emphasize that we are working with HPD to try to build these buildings as affordable as possible. So the open door term sheet, the program under which we're developing, um, it, it makes it that the way that the financing goes, we've come to the 80% to 110% AMI level to be able to construct these buildings and um, sell them and still have them be able to operate feasibly. I would love to be able to get that number lower and we're still gonna have a lot of work to do between now and the time that we are successful in financing these projects because we have a lot of folks in Bushwick and when I presented this to the uh, community board in Bushwick as well, um, they, they said the same thing. You know, We have other projects where we get AMIs as low as 30% or lower. Um, there, there's not necessarily a mechanism to welcome homeless folks into this project so uh, this is admittedly a slightly higher, maybe middle income project for folks who wanted to purchase those two buildings. So that's a concern that I have, which uh, would really have to be addressed if we're going to, if I'm going to move forward with support for this project, because what would then happen is that we would bring in new owners that do not look like or have not been a part of the community because they're not reflected in this income ban. And what we're talking about then is displacement and pushing people out and gentrification. So I have concerns about that. Thank I you. understand. I, I would just like to add that the market in the neighborhood does include similar buildings, two unit fee simple homes that are between 800,000 to 1.5 million to purchase. And so uh, the, the point of the open door program is to try to lower that, but I don't know if HBD is able to finance it if we go even lower, but I'm trying to make that happen. Uh, thank you. And I think that uh, the community is at a disadvantage because they don't have a representative who can stand and definitively say on behalf of that community, uh, whether or not it's reflective and represents what the community wants. Although I did hear you say that you spoke to the community board and I heard you say that they also had the same kinds of concerns. So it is an issue. They don't have a dedicated or designated representative and I have concerns about that as well. Thank you. Thank you, council member. We're gonna go ahead and ask HPD to proceed and um, any other questions um, about any project, we're going to go back and revisit after that presentation. Great. Uh, again, Sarah Mallory with HPD and testify on Bedsty Central and North One. Land use item number 670 consists of the proposed disposition approval and Article 11 tax benefits for a project known as Bedsty Central and North Phase One. The project area comprises 13 city-owned vacant lots located on Block 1686, Lot 48, Block 1356, Lot 6, Block 1589, Lot 58, Block 1651, Lot 52, Block 1657, Lot 59, Block 1687, Lots 47, 73, 173, and 80, Block 1708, Lot 67, Block 1710, lots 49, 51, and 52 in Brooklyn Council District 36. 
A portion of the project area is made up of urban renewal sites that were designated for residential uses as part of the Fulton Park Urban Renewal Plan, sites 19, 21A, 22A, 23B, and 42, which was approved in September 11, 1985, and has since been amended twice. Once on November 16, 1992, and again on September 24, 2003. The Fulton Park Urban Renewal Plan is currently active and will expire in 2028. The city and lots were included in a prior solicitation in 2005 and were to be disposed of under a former home ownership program known as New Foundations. However, the project was stalled for a few reasons. First, the economic downturn at the time, and second, it was discovered that the then development team engaged in construction practices that resulted in unacceptable build-out conditions in their previous projects. Therefore, mm -hmm. HPD issued a termination of negotiations letter on July mm -hmm. 29, 2014. In 2015, HPD issued a new request for a proposal and selected Shelter Rock Builders LLC to develop the project under HPD's Open Door Program. Under the Open Door Program, the city on parcels will be conveyed to Restored Homes Housing Development Fund Corporation, HGFC, who will partner with the Heritage 5 LLC, the sponsor, to complete the construction. The sponsor proposes to construct two two-family and nine three-family homes. Each home will contain rental units providing a combined total of 31 residences. The homes will be built to meet enterprise green housing standards. Upon construction completion, homes will be marketed to families with annual household incomes between 80% and 130% of the AMI. It is anticipated that homes will average $672,000 to $783,600 for a two family and $640,500 to $838,900 for a three family home. It should be noted that as part of the open door program, purchasers are required to abide by resale restrictions. If a homeowner sells or refinances during the regulatory period, the homeowner may realize up to a 2% appreciation on the original purchase price per year of owner occupancy. Additionally, homeowners will also be required to sell to a household earning no more than the project's income limit. In addition to disposition approval, HPD seeks approval of an Article 11 tax exemption for Block 1686, Lot 48, Block 1356, Lot 6, Block 1589, Lot 58, Block 1651, Lot 52, Block 1657, Lot 59, Block 1687, Lots 47, 73, 173, and 80, Block 1708, Lot 67, Block 1710, Lots 49, 51, and 52. The value of the Article 11 tax benefit is estimated to be $251,000 and the term of the benefits will be five years, which is the length of the estimated construction phase and marketing timeline. Following the date of reconveyance from the sponsor to the purchasing homeowner, each home will receive tax benefits under the Urban Development Action Area Procedure. UDAP statutes, which covers a 20 year period. First 10 years at full exemption, followed by 10 years of decreasing amounts in 10 equal allotments on an annual basis. In order to facilitate construction of the bed Central and North Phase One project and maintain affordability, HPD is before the subcommittee requesting approval of land use item number 670. And that concludes HPD's testimony. Thank you very much. I will now recognize uh, any questions, any other questions from my colleagues. I see council member Amprey Samuel on mute. You have to unmute. Oh, you can unmute. Someone please unmute. Councilmember Amprey Samuel. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions um, for clarity. Um, one is related to the AMI. During the presentation, I heard both up to 80% AMI and I also heard 70% AMI and the slide itself referenced 70%. And so I just wanted to get a little clarity around that. Um, and then also, can you provide me with a little more detail about the breakdown of the senior units and the set aside for the formerly homeless? Because it's hard to distinguish between, um, you know, exactly um, if the senior units are actually part of or could be part of the homeless set asides. Um, and the last question I had is, will you be working at all, and this is for settlement houses, 
with the um, young people that's part of that youth build program that's on um, St. John's within your buildings um, with this particular development. So I, I can respond to the, uh, a couple of questions. One specifically, that's a good question about the, 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 the seniors breakout. Uh, and I just wanna make sure, can folks hear me? This is Michael Gabry. Yes. So, um, so in regard to the question, uh, so six of, the, so there's a total of eight homeless units and of that eight, six of them will be uh, designated for seniors. And those eight units, we anticipate that they'll all uh, receive project-based Section 8 vouchers. And then, uh, uh, so then in addition to the six units that are for homeless, uh, formerly homeless seniors, then we'll have senior units uh, 10 at 30% uh, AMI, and then we'll have another 10 at 40% uh, uh, AMI. I, I think, does that answer your question, Council Member Amprey Samuel? in regard to the senior units? Please unmute Council Member Amprey Samuel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it, so it does help because now I'm clear with the, um, the 26, 26 of the 26 is for formerly homeless seniors. That's um, right. So that, so that is helpful. So with the remaining 20, I go back to, so can you tell me what the 40, with 40% 40 AMI is? For sure, sure. So the, the income range um, for, for the 40% AMI would be from approximately 25,271, the annual income to uh, 37,800 and uh, Actually, excuse me, because we only have studios and one bedroom. So from 25,271 to 31,561. And I think um, just to clarify, I know uh, when you were speaking in the beginning, uh, I believe you were referencing the 29, excuse me, the 2019 income limits. And so the numbers that I'm referencing are the 2020 uh, income uh, limits. So that's why I think our numbers were, are a little different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, and, and I've mentioned this before in the past when we talked about the um, senior breakouts. Um, I know HPD has heard this a billion times from me um, that when we're talking about set asides for seniors, um, and when you get into that 40% AMI range, you know, what seniors are we actually talking about? We, we may not be talking about the seniors in that particular area um, because when you look at the other 202 buildings um, and even the NYCHA um, senior buildings. Uh, you have seniors that have social security and um, and then even the ones that have retired and they might have a pension as social security, it doesn't rise to the $35,000 um, range for seniors. And so, you know, I, I always question, is there a way we can figure out how to get more subsidy to make that a little more affordable for the seniors in this particular community? because that 40% AMI just does not at all um, speak to the seniors that live in, in the community. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to say that I've, I've mentioned this before. Yes, and one thing, and um, I know when Alexa speaks, she might be able to uh, talk about this because uh, we definitely, your, your, your point is very well taken. And we talked about, you know, one of the things I think Settlement Housing Fund has been successful at is helping uh, tenants find tenant-based rental subsidies so that they are able to fit into some of those income brackets. And that's one thing that we had uh, talked about in, in regard to this building is, you know, that's something that we could hopefully help bridge that through helping people identify potential tenant-based subsidies to help, um, to, to help with those higher income tiers. Hmm. Okay, the other question about the um, youth build. Yes, so on the youth build, I'm gonna defer to um, Alexa to, to touch on that. For the labs, um, in your facilities on Hi, um, can you, could you ask the question again? Are you asking about uh, the programming that we have on St. John's Place? I'm asking about the opportunities for um, for community residents to be able to work on the actual site itself 
and to be able to have an upfront conversation to ensure in some kind of agreement that the local hires is actually a priority. And because Settlement House already has a relationship with organizations right there within the St. John's buildings, um, I think that's low hanging fruit. That's, there's a relationship there already, a program in place. Um, and so is that something that has already been fleshed out and discussed? So we, the answer is yes. We are very committed to local hiring. Um, we, uh, when we engage with Beachwood organization, they're our general contractor. They'll be the ones that are responsible for doing the hiring. But one of the things that we've talked to them about and asked them to commit to before joining the partnership was to hire uh, students from our local youth build program to work on the site. Um, and we always as, uh, work with our general contractors to make sure that they abide by um, the requirements around local hiring. So that is something that Beachwood has committed to. Um, I can't speak to exactly how they, they go about doing that because um, you know, that's something that they do when they're not on the, the Zoom. But, you know, I can certainly follow up with a written response on our process for that. That would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome. Councilmember Barron has her hand raised. Please unmute yes. Councilmember Barron. Councilmember Barron. Mm -hmm. Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I support the comments of my colleague, uh, Alika Ampi Samuel. I think that's very important. And I have a question about the prices of the homes. Uh, I believe that you said the homes would range from 637000 up to 839000 Is that what you said? That's on the um, the Rise Borough project, I think. Um, I think that's on the Bed Stuy Central North. Bed Stuy Central, yeah. Eight hundred and thirty-nine thousand dollars. And where where what is the location? I I know you said thirteen lots, and uh, but I didn't get any of the locations of the addresses. But particularly for the homes. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely get back to you on that. Uh, that's you know, for the, the three family homes, so the largest of the options. Um, and we can get all, back to you on the-, the And, and the income, annual income requirement for that $839,000? Do we have the income requirement? So the entire program is between, so I can get the specifics on it, but the, you know, the entire program is between 880% AMI and 130% AMI overall. Um, but this one is going to be specifically between 83% and 123% AMI. Uh, that's, that's very high, particularly in a community that feels that they're being gentrified. But thank you very much. Yeah, I hear. And it, you know, one of the things that uh, we were talking about is that the um, district is a high district. It is just some of the areas within it do have very high market rate uh, amounts for what the, the homes are selling for. So this is below below the market rate for the neighborhood, definitely. And one last question, what is the exterior? Because you're talking about bed style, you're talking about brownstones, and you're talking about bricks. So what is the exterior? Um, ben, ben can speak a little bit more to it, but they're, they're all brick. They're brick, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, at this time, uh, we don't see any more questions. We are going to uh, excuse this panel and resume our vote on LU663. Thank you all very much for your presentations. Thank you for taking the time on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. On LU 663, the Adam Clayton Boulevard project, Council Member Barron, how do you vote? Permission to explain my vote. Chair recognizes Council Member Barron. Thank you. Uh, I asked for information about whether or not the tenants would be displaced, and I got the answer no, they do not have to, they won't be forced into purchasing. They have the option, but they do not have to purchase, and they can be made as tenants. And I said, great. And then the question came to me, tenants paying what rent? And I was told that they could remain as tenants, but they would have to pay 40% AMI for rentals. If this is a building where the average uh, AMI presently is 30% of the AMI, and if we're now saying that these tenants would be required to pay 40% of the AMI, and if we know that housing advocates say that 30% of your income is what is a good gauge for rentals, then this 40% is way above and would increase the existing tenants' uh, rental responsibility double or perhaps even more. So for that reason, I'm voting no. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Member Miller. Aye. Council Member Traeger. Aye. By a vote of four in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions, the item is recommended for approval. Thank you, Council. Uh, we will uh, resume. Uh, to the to the former subject matter, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the previous items? Chair Adams, there is a member of the public who wishes to testify on this item. Uh, Abraham Gross is here to testify. Okay. We'll move Mr. Gross over. And we'll see members of the public will be given two minutes to speak. Please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock and please remain in the meeting until after all council member questions. We are still waiting for uh, Avi Gross to be moved yes. into the panelist view. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation in the LU number or name of the project on which you'd like to testify. I um, recognize Mr. Gross. Right, thank you, honorable members of the council, my name is Abraham Gross, and I'd like to testify on behalf of all the projects that were mentioned. Um, and respectfully, if you feel so inclined, I might need a little bit more than two minutes. I mean, four minutes or even five minutes would be great. As an aggrieved law-abiding New York citizen, time. sorry. As an aggrieved law-abiding New York citizen whose life has been destroyed by a sickening scam that is also called affordable housing. I am begging you as public officials of integrity not to approve any of these projects before at the very least you listen to what I have to say and you see the evidence that I have obtained. Respectfully, you are all here by the power of the public. You represent the public's interest. The public is being aggrieved and betrayed not only by these deals, but by the entire um, scam that is called affordable housing. Respectfully, these aren't my words. These are mo what multiple whistleblowers with inside HPD has said, that the entire process is tainted with corruption, fraud, embezzlement, and racial discrimination. 
Karina Rodriguez and Ricarte Echevera are two credible HPD whistleblower employees who recently went in within a sworn affidavit in court detailed the horrors that HPD is engaged in. Affordable housing is a scam. And the more that this is denied by honorable members of the public, the more this scam will be allowed to go on. In my case, just to give you a couple of examples, from the very first day of the application process, I was already pressured to withdraw my application. I was then threatened that my application would be rejected if I redacted my social security number. And critically, because of the pressure we applied, HPD was forced to admit that out of 74,000 applicants to this project, they had rejected 73,773. So 99% of the applicants got rejected. This is what happens in any new construction affordable housing project. Of the apartments that were awarded, of the 246. Time's expired. Well, I'm asking. Mr. Gross, I'm gonna ask you to uh, wrap as quickly as possible. Okay, I'm just asking for 60 seconds, okay? These aren't, the, these aren't the allegations of a, a crazy person. Th this is, these are allegations that are proven by hard evidence, which I have. If you're wondering where DOI is in all this, unfortunately, that is a huge part of the problem. Many affordable uh, housing luxury apartments have gone to DOI investigators, have gone to the HPD decision makers, uh, have gone to the marketing agents, I am happy to share this evidence with you, but what I implore you to understand is that no one is watching. So I heard all these presentations and it sounds great. Affordable housing, um, they have a gym. It's all nice to present it like that, but when it comes down to it, the application process is so corrupt that these apartments are not going to affordable housing, uh, rightfully ap rightful applicants, a small percentages, just enough that no one asks any questions. And my, my last point is that the public, which you represent, is being aggrieved to the tune of billions of dollars. And it's going to take an honest public official of integrity to say, wait a minute, this guy is not speaking crazy language. He actually has evidence. And I'm gonna take a look at his evidence. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you so much for being here and your testimony. We appreciate it. I believe we have uh, counsel. I'll take your direction at this point. Uh, the next witness testifying on these items is Theo Chino. Theo Chino is now able to talk. Start in time. You can't see him. I think he's on. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, sorry, because I was coming from the phone. My computer doesn't work. Thank you very much, uh, Council. My name is Tio Chino. I live at 640 Riverside Drive, a building that was passed in Title 11 in 2003. I am a witness of what Mr. Gross said before, and I would like to ask the, I would like to ask, sorry, I'm bringing my camera on, so sorry. Uh, I would like to ask the council to look at every building that is passed in Title 11 because there was gross mismanagement of the fund that are allocated by HPD to all those Title 11. Our building has $46 million of dollar of debt that is passed upon us, the tenant of the building where I live at 640 Riverside Drive. So I would like to ask, because I saw several property in there that are in my city council, my city councilman has not 
Ex Mars Levine has not participated in the investigation and all the allegations. There is another building, for example, 544 East 13th Street, who was in the resolution 0374 in 2002. That building, one of the person who worked so hard to get into that building is today homeless. And he, she has reached to the mayor, she has reached to different people, and every time we go to the same thing. So I'm requesting the council to look and to do a deep investigation in the HPD and the department who handle all those property in Title 11. Because once they go in Title 11, it disappears, and all of us, the tenant, are branded as lunatic, crazy people, and things like that. And that thing has happened so long that you could see at the last order of TPT, they were taken from black and and, 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 and people of color, and that was uh, something. So please, council, look at all those Title 11 in detail, look at the tenant, ask questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it. Before, before you leave, are you also dialed in? We, we see an unknown caller. Um, is that you also? Do you, that's somebody else? All right, thank you. It appears there's another witness, uh, unidentified at this point. Um, unknown caller 9968. Is unknown caller 9968 uh, unmuted? Maybe there is not another caller. If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on these items, please raise your hand now. The committee will stand at ease while we resolve a technical issue. Um, sorry, can can I respectfully, again, council members, I just wanted to ask if anyone had any questions for me or for Mr. Chen, because we're speaking on behalf of a lot of aggrieved people, uh, aggrieved New Yorkers who have been abused by the affordable housing programs. Who's talking right now? Sorry, uh, this was uh, Abraham Gross just asking permission um, to ask if any of the honorable council members had any questions for me or Mr. Chin. I see no other members of the public waiting to testify on this item, these items. Mr. Adams, can you hear me? I can hear you, Council. Thank you very much. There are no other members of the public who wish to testify on LU 666-667. 68669 or 670. Okay. Thank you very much. Bear with me. Next, I believe we're ready to hear from LPC. Uh, you close the public hearings at this time. Okay. Seeing no further uh, members of the public wishing to testify or council member questions. We will close. We will close the uh, items on the uh, HPD calendar at this time.
And we'll move into the presentation by LPC. We'll hear three applications. I'm going to name the numbers of what we just closed. The public hearings on LU 666, 667, 668, 669, and 670 are now closed. Next, we will hear three applications submitted by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Pursuant to Section 3020 of the Charter of the City of New York and Section 25-303 of the Administrative Code of the City of New York, proposing the rescission and amendment of prior landmark designations. LU 671 is an application proposing the rescission of the landmark designation of Beth Hamadrash, Hargadol Synagogue, originally the Norfolk Street Baptist Church, and the landmark site of 60-64 Norfolk Street in Councilmember Chin's district in Manhattan. LU 672 is an application amending the landmark designation of the Alexander Hamilton House, AKA Hamilton George, to make its landmark site 414 West 141st Street in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. And LU 673 is an application amending the landmark designation of the Kingsland Homestead to make its landmark site 143 35th Avenue in the district represented by Councilmember Ku in Queens. Council. Please announce the LPC panel. One moment. Uh, Tim Fry, Tim yes. Fry, and Kate Lemos McHale will be testifying on all three applications on, on behalf of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Okay, thank you. Council, please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands and state your names. Tim Fry. Kate Lemus McHale. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. The PowerPoint presentation you provided to the subcommittee will be loaded into Zoom when you're ready and will be advanced when you say next. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the Landmarks Committee. I'm Tim Fry, the Director of Special Projects at the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and I'm joined by the Director of Research, Kate Lemos McHale. I'm here to present you uh, three housekeeping items, the first being the rescission of the landmark designation for 60-64 Norfolk Street on June 30th, 2020. May I have the presentation, please? And the next slide. The next slide, please. And that is the historic photo at time of designation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 60 Norfolk Street was vacated in 2007 due to serious structural issues and in 2017 suffered a catastrophic fire that, as you see from the photo on the left, severely damaged the building. In a series of votes beginning in 2017, LPC eventually approved demolition of the entire site due to hazardous conditions. In its June 2019 vote to approve full demolition, LPC found that the loss of historic fabric due to the fire, structural issues, and partial demolition of unstable masonry had resulted in a building and site that no longer conveyed significance or integrity as an individual landmark. The synagogue is working with developers to incorporate remnants of the historic synagogue and sacred objects into the, the design of a new building and synagogue at the vacant site. At the public hearing on the rescission of the landmark site on June 30th, 2020, the commission received testimony from one individual lamenting the, last, the, the loss of the landmark. Next slide, please. The commission vote, voted to rescind the landmark designation because the designated building has been demolished and nothing of architectural, historic, or cultural significance remains on the landmark site. LPC recommends that you uphold this action, and thank you. I'm happy to take any questions on this item. Next slide. And next slide.
Uh, the Kingsland Homestead is one of the oldest buildings in Queens. The Kingsland Homestead was named after Captain Joseph King, son-in-law of Charles Doherty, who, con who constructed the property around 1785 in the Dutch colonial style. The landmark was moved shortly after its designation. An amendment of the landmark designation reflects its relocation to Weeping Beach Park, Park in Queens. Next slide. Kingsland Homestead was designated in 1965 at 40-25 155th Street, Block 5270, Lot 14, and in an early decision, LPC approved Certificate of Appropriateness Number 9 to relocate the landmark to its current site at 143-35 37th Avenue, Block 5012, Lot 60, which is also the site of the landmark The Weeping Beach Tree indicated here on the right hand, uh, right part of the slide. Next slide. The former lot was subdivided into seven lots for the construction of a series of brick row houses in 1970. Tax block 5275 included lots 1, 111, 112, 115, 117, 119, and 120. The landmark in its new location, as seen here on the right, operate, operates as the headquarters of the Queens Historical Society. It's main, maintained by NYC Parks, which acquired the park site in 1925 and expanded the park to its current size in 1976. Next slide. At the public hearing on the, on the amendment of the, or the rescission of the landmark site, on June 30th, 2020, the commission received testimony from representatives of the Historic House Trust of New York City and Queens Historical Society and Queens Kingland Homestead House Museum, all in support of the amendment. The commission voted to amend the landmark designation of Kingsland Homestead to reflect its current location in Weeping Beach Park. And this entailed rescinding the designation of its former site and designating the land beneath its current location as its landmark site. Next slide. And the next. The Alexander Hamilton House, which is also known as the Grange, is a federal style house named after the Scottish home of Alexander Hamilton's paternal grandfather. The landmark was moved after its designation and the proposal was to amend the landmark designation to reflect its current location in St. Nicholas Park. Next slide. Over its lifetime, the building has been moved three times. Alexander Hamilton erected the house as a country retreat on 35 acres in 1801, seen at the center of this map. In 1889, the house was moved 500 feet and operated as a chapel and later a rectory for the adjacent St. Luke's Church. Next slide. In 1960, the Department of the Interior designated Hamilton Grange as a National Historic Landmark. In 1966, LPC designated the property as an, a New York City landmark. And in 1976, Congress passed legislation establishing Hamilton Grange as a national memorial. And it was at this time that, time, uh, that funds were appropriated for its relocation and restoration. Next slide. In November of 1974, LPC designated the Hamilton Heights Historic District, which includes St. Luke's Church and the former site of the Grange. The amendment applied only to the individual landmark designation. St. Luke's Church and its entire site remains in the Hamilton Heights Historic District and within LPC's jurisdiction. Next slide. In 1993, LPC issued a Certificate of Appropriateness approving the schematic proposal to move Hamilton Grange from 287 Convent Avenue, Block 2050, Lot 4, to its current site at 414 141st Street, Block 1957, Lot 140, in St. Nicholas Park. In 2008, the National Park Service completed relocation of the property to St. Nicholas Park. Next slide. And that re relocation is reflected in these photos here. Next slide. 
After complete restoration, the landmark reopened to the public on September 17, 2011. At the public hearing on the rescission of the landmarks of the landmark site on June 30, 2020, the commission received no testimony regarding the item. The commission voted to amend the landmark designation of the Grange to reflect its current location in St. Nicholas Park, and this entailed rescinding the designation of its former site and designating the land beneath its current location as its landmark site in St. Nicholas Park. And this concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite my colleagues to ask questions uh, of the panel. If you have questions for the panel, please click the raise hand button on the participant panel council. Are there any questions from my colleagues at this time? I don't see any. Councilmember Barron, I see you. <laughs> please unmute Councilmember Barron. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, no questions. I just wanted to say that was a very interesting history and uh, just hope that as as that historical piece is being presented, that we might have some references also to some of the social conditions that existed at that time, particularly now in light of all of the demonstrations and protests. So just to help to put it in context, but I found it very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. There being no more questions, for this panel. The panel was excused. Council, are there any members of the public wishing to testify on any of these landmark items? There are. Uh, Mr. Tiochino is here to testify on these items as well. Okay, members of the public, you're going to be given two minutes to speak. Please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. We are taking your testimony on any of these three landmark items at this time. Thank you. Starting time. Mr. Chino. Yeah, hi, dear, dear Council. This is Tio Chino again. Uh, I live at 640 Riverside Drive, which is on 141st and Riverside, and the Hamilton Grange is part of our historical district. Whatever change I've been trying to read through the land use, whatever the change are going to be, there is the space where the land, the Grange used to be, that is empty and is a park administered by the U.S. Park Service. I would like, before any of that space be given to the City of New York or HPD, that HPD be completely and 100% investigated for the same reason as previous testimony. It has been, there has been mismanagement of funds, and I would not want to see a piece of the history of my neighborhood be given to real estate developer that will use that space to build something that will not be for what it was. So right now the space is used as a public garden. It should be made for the community to be remember what was there and to be a part of the historical history of the Hamilton Grange, of the Hamilton Height neighborhood, which I live in. I see, the, I see because of all those Title 11 things, I have seen the devastation that has happened, and I really hope the council member will investigate HPD and all the people that have to deal with HPD and keeping all those, um, all those assets that belongs to the people back to the city, back to the council, where the council can say, yes, something went wrong. So please do not give the space, that little space, to the, to the developer of the city of New York. Um, 23 seconds, I re I, I'll, I'll hand my time back to the council with no explicit like happened in Los Angeles. Thank you very much for your time. Have a uh, after, nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you once again for your testimony. The next witness here to testify on LU 671 is Avi Gross. Start in time. Council members, uh, thank you. Once again. 
thank you for uh, to Miss Kelly and everyone managing this on the technical side. Uh, respectfully, council members, um, being homeless during the pandemic and watching how the only opportunity you ever were approved for before being rejected four times based on four different reasons, while watching so many other applicants who own million dollar apartments in California. This was proven, this was substantiated by the DOI. That's who the apartments are going to, you know, it's no- Mr. Gross, I'm going to interrupt you at this time. We are taking testimony and comments on the three items that we have just reviewed by LPC for landmarks. Do you have anything to add? Yes, respectfully, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, my, my specific comment about these specific projects is who is monitoring to make sure that the people within HPD that are um, filing the applications or you're saying it's okay, not? Mr. Gross, I'm going to interrupt you because HPD did not present on the landmark items today. So we're going to thank you for your testimony and we're going to move on. Thank you very much for being here today. Council, are there any other members of the public wishing to testify? If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on LU 671, 672, or 673, please raise your hand now. Seeing none, there are no members of the public here to testify. Okay, thank you very much. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify, um, the public hearings on LU numbers 671, 672, and 673 are now closed. And this does conclude today's business. All of today's items are laid over. I remind you that if you have written testimony on any of today's items, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. I'd like to thank the applicants, all members of the public, my colleagues, of course, subcommittee council, land use staff, and the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>